And so it's a pleasure to have uh, Professor Ding Wanko uh, to, to lecture us today. He'll talk about more of any question on compressed line force. Thanks. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, I'm going to uh, talk about the complex Mont-Jean-Pair equation. And I, I'll begin by talking about Yao's theorem. And uh, I'll say a little bit about um, applications, well, the application to the uh, so-called Calabi conjecture. Um, So, uh, which is equivalent, in fact, to the Yao solution of the, uh, of the complex Martian pair equation. And then I'll say something about, about the proof. And then I want to talk a little bit about some, some more recent developments going, going beyond um, uh, Yao's theorem on the complex Martian pair equation. I want to talk about the case of Hermitian metrics and a Mangin pair equation for Hermitian metrics. And then secondly, I want to talk about um, balanced and Godeschamp metrics and, uh, and, and uh, a corresponding Mangin pair equation there. So let me, let me begin with the, uh, with the, with the complex Mangin pair equation. So what is it? So uh, first of all, on if we're working on, on CN, or say some domain in CN, um, and we have some real valued function phi, the Mangin pair equation says that if you look at the complex Hessian of phi, d2 phi dzi dzj bar, take that matrix and take the determinant, if that's if we set that equal to some given function f, f will be a real valued function, so is phi, then that's called the, the Mangin pair equation. And we usually, well, we, we specify that this matrix, the complex Hessian matrix, has to be at least um, non negative. So that is the, that's the Mangin pair equation. Well, uh, on a compact manifold, so now I'll take m to be a compact complex manifold, uh, we immediately see that this equation doesn't make any sense. Um, the condition that dd bar phi is non-negative by the maximum principle tells you immediately that phi, phi has to be a constant. So the equation is written it does, doesn't make any sense. But what we can do is we can take a Kähler metric, so I can take g a Kähler metric, and as we saw from the last talk, um, given a Kähler metric, we associate to that a, a real closed 1, 1 form, omega, which I write in local coordinates as gij bar dzi wedge dzj bar. The condition of being Kähler is that this real one one form is closed, then we can consider, so instead of considering dd bar phi, the complex Hessian of phi, we replace dd bar phi by omega plus dd bar phi. And then there are plenty of non-constant um, functions which uh, have this, in fact, strictly positive. So, uh, this, uh, so this brings me to the, uh, the Mangin pair equation on, on compact Kähler manifolds. And this is what, what Yao solved. So this is uh, Yao's theorem from 76. And uh, it, 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 it goes as follows. So we take M, G, compact Kähler manifold. And we, we take, uh, as given data, we take, uh, we take f at any, any given smooth function on m. I impose a normalization condition. So I, I impose that the integral of e to the f omega to the n is equal to integral of omega to the n. So here, omega is the 
the one one form associated to G. So uh, Jan's theorem says that uh, then there exists, and it's unique, um, a smooth function phi satisfying the complex Marchand-Pair equation, which is that omega plus dd bar phi, or in other words, the determinant of gij bar plus didj bar phi to the power n, this is equal to e to the f omega to the n. So in other words, the determinant of gij bar plus didj bar phi equals e to the f times the uh, determinant of gij bar. Right, yes. Yeah. So, 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 so whenever I write g and omega, I'm assuming that g and omega are related in this way. And, uh, and of course, we, we, we insist that omega plus dd bar phi is positive. And of course, the, for, to have uniqueness, we need to have one more condition, because I could always add a constant to phi, and I would get another solution. So I have to impose some normalization condition on phi. So let's suppose that the super phi is 0. So there's a unique, uh, there exists a unique solution to this equation. So that, that's, uh, that's Yao's theorem. And, uh, and, um, and, and, it's, and it's equivalent to uh, what's known as the, the Calabi conjecture. So let me say something about that. First, let me say something about Ricci curvature and the first churn class of, of, a, of, a, of a Kähler manifold. So um, as we saw in the last talk, we can define the, uh, well, perhaps we didn't yet see this formula, so let me introduce it. The, we can define the Ricci curvature of a Kähler metric as follows. We can define it to be minus dd bar log of the determinant of g. So uh, this gives me a real closed 1, 1 form and uh, it's certainly not obvious but it's a fact that uh, this coincides with the, the, Ricci, the usual Ricci curvature in the Riemannian sense for G. Okay, so this is the, 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 the Ricci curvature. And we define what's known as the first churn class. So this is the first churn class. C1 of M to be, uh, I simply take the cohomology class of this real closed 1, 1 form. Sometimes there's a factor, well, there's usually a factor of 2 pi. I'm ignoring that. This is an element of H11 MR, which I'm going to define to be the, you, you simply take the, the D bar closed real 1, 1 forms. And you quotient out by the, the D bar exact ones. Um, if I notice that if you're d bar closed and you're a real 1, 1 form, it's the same as being d closed. But in fact, by the d d bar lemma in Kähler geometry, which I'm not going to state, one can see that actually this is the same thing as taking the d closed real 1, 1 forms divided by, quotient out by the, the image of d d bar where now this is being applied to, dd bar is now being applied to functions. So this is the definition of a cohomology class. And the way I've defined it, 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 it depends on a metric. It depends on a metric omega. But in fact, it, it doesn't depend on a metric omega. So that's what I want to show next. And that's not difficult to see. So what we see is that C1 of M is, is independent of, of the metric omega. 
And uh, why is that? Well, uh, suppose omega prime is another Kähler metric, so another Kähler form with associated metric. So, so g prime is the associated metric to omega prime. Then uh, if you take, if you look at determinants of g prime and compare it to the determinant of g, both of these give defined volume forms on your manifold. If you divide one by the other, you get a scalar function. And therefore, there exists some smooth function f such that determinant of g prime divided by determinant of g is e to the f for some f. And so if you compute the Ricci curvature of omega prime, which by definition all I do is take minus dd bar of log of determinant of g prime, then I'm going to get minus dd bar log of this, which is Ricci of omega, and then minus dd bar log of f, so I get a minus dd bar f. And you see that the Ricci curvature of omega prime and the Ricci curvature of omega have the same cohomology class. They differ by something. Uh, d, if I, they differ by dd bar of something. So the cohomology class is the same. And so that shows that the this first churn class is independent of choice of metrics. It's a well-defined. Um, cohomology class, depending only on the on the complex manifold. So, uh, so, so now I can tell you uh, what the uh, I can tell you what the Calabi conjecture is. So this is a corollary of of Yau's theorem. So this is the Calabi conjecture, which is of course not a theorem. And it says that uh, if, you're, if you're given, oh, OK, let's take m omega compact Kähler as there. Then if you're given, given any um, capital omega representing the first churn class, so in other words, I'm taking capital omega as some closed real 1-1 one, one form, which is in that cohomology class, there exists, and it's unique, a Kähler metric, a Kähler metric omega prime, which is in the cohomology class of omega. So omega, of course, is also a d bar closed real 1-1 one, one form. So it also defines an element of H11. And there exists a, a unique Kähler metric omega prime in that cohomology class, in the so-called Kähler class, such that the Ricci curvature of omega prime is equal to that given representative capital omega. So given any representative of the first Chern class, any representative is, is actually the Ricci curvature of a Kähler metric. And there's a unique one in each Kähler class. And the proof is essentially just given, I've essentially already given it, but let me just, uh, let, let me just spell it out. So, uh, so given capital omega and C1 of M, well, by definition, to be in C1 of M, we know, well, we know that the Ricci of omega is also in C1 of M. So, uh, so I can write this as Ricci of omega uh, and if two plus something, if two objects are in the same cohomology class, they differ by the image of dd bar. So, uh, so they differ by dd bar of a function or minus dd bar of a function. It doesn't matter. And then uh, we want to apply Yau's theorem. So we we let omega prime, which is omega plus dd bar phi. And there's a unique phi up to adding a constant, which is going to give me a unique omega prime. Let this solve the complex Monjean pair equation. 
omega prime to the n, which is omega plus dd bar phi to the n, is e to the f omega to the n. And then you compute that the Ricci curvature of omega prime is minus dd bar log of, of omega prime to the n, which is going to be Ricci of omega plus minus, right? Yeah, mi minus dd bar f, because I have to take minus dd bar log. But, but that's exactly capital omega. Okay, so, 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 so that shows that the Yau's theorem is, implies the Calabi conjecture, and in fact, it's, they're, they're equivalent. Um, so, of course, there's a, maybe I will go here. No, I will go here. In fact, there's a, a more a rather often used consequence of this, and that is the special case that deals with the special case of when c1 of m is 0. So there's a, a consequence, of course, is that if c1 of m is 0, then just by taking capital omega is 0, um, then you see that there exists a unique omega prime in the cohomology class of omega, which is, of course, Kähler, uh, which, which, is, which is Ricci flat. So the Ricci curvature of omega prime is 0. And you often see Yau's theorem stated as, as this. But of course, this is just a consequence, since Yau's theorem ho ho holds for any, any manifold n. OK, so that's, uh, that's the, uh, the Calabi conjecture and its consequence. So I want to say something about the proof. And since it's just a one-hour lecture, I'm not going to give you the whole proof of, of Yau's theorem. But I want to just outline some of the key ideas. So, uh, the, uh, so, so we want to prove the, uh, I guess I raised the statement. So we want to solve. So we want to solve uh, omega plus dd bar phi to the n is e to the f omega to the n. And the idea which uh, goes back to Calabi is to consider the continuity method. And uh, the idea of the continuity method is you introduce a parameter t, and you consider a one-parameter family of equations, which I'll call star t. That is, we consider omega plus dd bar phi t to the n is equal to e to the tf plus a constant, let me say a second, a word, a word or two about that in a second. Uh, and, and, and we insist that, of course, omega plus dd bar phi t is, is positive. Well, here t is going from 0 to 1. So here, uh, here ct is a constant chosen. So C, ct is, is chosen so that uh, the, the, the integral of e to the t f plus c t omega to the n is equal to integral of omega to the n. And that's a necessary condition to solve this, because if you can have a solution, then the integral of the right-hand side had better be the, equal to the integral of the left-hand side. And by Stokes theorem, the integral of the left-hand side, after integrating my part, is just integral omega to the n. OK, so we can do that, and that ct is bounded depending only on, on f. Uh, so, so, so the idea is that we, we consider a number capital T, which is the supremum. Oh, well, OK, let me not write it like that. We consider capital T to be all t prime in 0, 1, such that there exists, let's say, a smooth solution phi t of star t for t going from 0 to t prime. And, uh, and what you see is that 0 
is trivially an element, because we have a solution at t is 0, I can just take v0 to be 0. Um, the other thing you can observe is that, I'm not going to go into this, but that the capital T is open. And the reason the capital T is open is that uh, by, by uh, you can use the, the inverse function theorem. You can, uh, once you have a solution for some t, you can find a solution for nearby t. Strictly speaking, you also need some elliptic estimates. So to apply the inverse function theorem, you will need to work in some Banach space like C2 plus alpha. But by elliptic estimates, actually, any such solution would be smooth. So one can get openness by, um, by, by using the inverse function theorem and some standard elliptic theory. And the, hard, the heart of the matter is to show that T is, T is closed. And if we can show t is closed, then actually, by connectedness of the interval, it must be the whole of 0, 1. And that would mean we have a solution at t equals 1. But the solution at t equals 1 is exactly what we're looking for. So if we can show closed, then, then well, given this, we're done. To show that it's closed, we need uniform estimates on phi of t which are independent, independent of t, independent of t. And that allows us to, to take a limit. So once you get a sequence of solutions, you take a limit, and you can show that it's closed. So I want to say something about this uh, closeness part. And I can only really say something about one estimate, which is the, the L infinity estimate, or the super phi estimate. Uh, so I want to say something about that. So I want to say something about this uh, the L infinity estimate. OK, so let, let's, uh, let's go back to what we're trying to prove. We, we have this solution phi of t. Um, so in fact, well, in fact, it's equivalent to showing the following. So assume we have uh, a solution of omega plus dd bar phi. Let me drop the t. Let's call it phi. And let me, instead of writing t, f, t plus c, t, I'll just write f tilde. So here, f tilde will be my t, f, plus c, t. And then, uh, and then I, I claim the following. So I claim that the, the, the L infinity norm of phi, I'm, now I'm assuming phi is a priori smooth. This is the same thing as just a soup of phi. I claim this is bounded by a constant. And that constant only depends on the fixed data, so the complex manifold M and the metric G. And it only depends on the soup norm of F tilde, or on, a, on a, any bound to the soup norm of F tilde. And in particular, it will be independent of T. OK, so that's, uh, that's the, the, the estimate I want to talk about. And uh, you need normalize that to do it. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I need to it. You're right. Okay. So let's uh, let's let's normalize it. Uh, let, let's assume. So before I was normalizing this f sup zero. Let, let's for for convenience, I'm going to normalize so that the integral of phi omega to the n is zero. And that that will do just as well. Okay. So if let me say if. Okay. So. Uh, so how do I prove that? Well, uh, I'm, 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 let me just say something about it in the case n equals 2. And I want to start with a, a sort of baby version. The idea is you integrate phi against omega squared minus omega phi squared. So here I'm writing omega phi for omega plus dd bar phi. I'm doing a dimension two, but uh, it works just the same in any dimension. Um, OK, so the, the first thing is that I can, well, we know from uh, high school algebra that's a difference of two squares. 
So this is omega minus omega phi wedge omega plus omega phi. But um, by definition, omega minus omega phi is, is minus dd bar phi. So this is phi minus dd bar phi wedge omega plus omega phi. And then we integrate by parts. And when I integrate by parts, I integrate this d by parts. And of course, omega is closed. Omega plus dd bar phi is also closed. So um, I can integrate by parts. I get rid of the minus sign. I get root minus 1 d phi wedge d bar phi wedge omega plus omega phi. And now this is something positive, wedge something positive. And what I can do is throw away one of those positive terms. So this is bigger than the integral of root minus 1 d phi wedge d bar phi wedge omega. But this is exactly, well, up to some, maybe up to some factor of 2 or something like that. This is equal to integral of omega of, of the gradient of phi squared right, with respect to g. OK, so, so, so I, I see that. On the other hand, I notice that using the, the equation, I know that omega phi squared is equal to some fixed thing, e to the f tilde omega to the n. So this is bounded by integral of absolute value of phi omega squared by some constant capital C, where that constant depends only on these guys here. Well, this looks very good, because now we have a, an estimate for the L2 norm of the gradient of phi uh, in terms of the L1 norm of phi. And that, that's rather nice, because in particular, it's going to tell us that we have um, an L2 bound. So let me explain that. So by the, uh, by the Poincaré inequality, Poincaré inequality says that whenever the average is 0, the gradient of phi squared is bounded below by the integral of phi squared multiplied by some small positive constant. So what we get is that the integral of phi, this is bigger than the integral of phi squared, sorry, the gradient of phi, and the Poincaré tells me this is bigger than some small constant times the integral of phi squared by Poincaré. This is for some uniform C. It depends only on, 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 on omega. But on the other hand, by Cauchy-Schwartz, uh, this is bounded by the volume, so the integral of 1, so the 1 half, uh, or rather, the integral of omega squared, let's say, and then the integral of phi squared, omega squared to the one half, and then uh, and then you conclude that that the integral of phi squared is bounded. The integral of phi squared, omega squared, <coughs> is uniformly bounded. Well, in fact, this isn't really telling us very much. In fact, it you don't even actually need this equation to, to tell you that the, the L2 norm of phi is bounded. In fact, that's always true. Uh, if you normalize phi in the right way, you can always get a bound like this, without, even without the equation. But this basic idea is, 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 is what's going to tell us, um, well, it's going it's to tell us how to, how to prove the, the L infinity estimate. So the, the, the idea to make this thing work the idea is to, to replace, now we, now we go back and we replace phi by a power of phi. That's the first thing we need. The second thing we need is we need to use the Sobolev inequality. So we're going to use the Sobolev inequality instead of the Poincaré, because it's going to give us a little bit more gain than which we need. So okay. So what is the Poincaré inequality? In, in complex dimension two, it says that the integral of any function 
So the 4, the power 4, to the power 1 half is bounded by the, a, a uniform constant c times the integral of the gradient of f squared plus, plus the integral of f squared. Here I'm integrating against the, the fixed volume form omega squared. So, so the, the, these are the key, key, key ingredients. So I'm going to go back to, uh, to where I started and repeat the argument, but now replace phi with a power of phi. Uh, well, almost. I'm going to do something slightly different. I'm going to replace phi by phi multiplied by phi to the power of q, um, where q is some non-negative integer. So let me explain what I'm doing. So here q is bigger than 0. And um, why do I do this? Well, the, the, the map that sends x to x times x, so this is an exercise in first year calculus, is this function is, is differentiable. And it has derivative uh, x to the q. Which is which is positive. So it's just a technical device. A technical device. I'm going to uh, replace the power of phi with this uh, this funny looking power. Oops. Okay. So the first thing to notice is that as here we can bound this by a constant times integral of phi to the q plus one. Again, using the equation. But now I get q plus 1. On the other hand, uh, I can again write this as phi, phi to the q is a minus sign. And then I get dd bar phi wedge omega plus omega phi. And then I integrate by parts. And when I integrate by parts, the derivative lands on this guy here. But then I'm going to use the fact that its derivative is x to the q. So I get phi to the q root minus 1 d phi wedge d bar phi wedge omega plus omega phi. But now what I'm going to do is use the fact that this phi to the q is positive. And so what I can do is I can replace this equality with an inequality and get rid of this omega phi just as I did before. So here I, I, I got rid of it just by, I just threw that away because it was positive. I'm doing the same thing here. On the other hand, I want to see that this is something like an L2 norm of a gradient, like this. So I'm going to rewrite this. Oh, sorry, I missed the Q. Oh, yeah, sorry, I missed the power of Q, of course. X is positive, but you have to have a Q plus 1 there. You can see that otherwise. So there's a Q plus 1. But now uh, what I can do is I can rewrite this as q plus 1 divided by q over 2 plus 1 squared, and then the integral of d of phi and then phi to the q over 2, wedge d bar of phi, phi to the q over 2, wedge omega. So here, I, when I differentiate, I get a power phi to the q over 2, another phi to the q over 2. I, each time, I get a q over 2 plus 1 from, from applying this formula. So now I have a bound on the gradient of this guy here in terms of a power of phi. And uh, I claim that if I apply the Sobolev inequality, I'm going to get a gain, which is enough to, 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 to give me what I want. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to apply the Sobolev with f equal to this. I'm going to call f this guy here. And we're going to apply the Sobolev inequality. OK, so let me go here. So now I want to uh, so apply Sobolev. So I put f equal to phi, and then phi to the q over 2 which implies that the absolute value of f 
is phi to the q over 2 plus 1, which is the same as phi to the q plus 2 over 2. And then what I get is that the integral of f, f to the 4 is now going to be the integral of phi to the 2 and then q plus 2 is going to be bounded by a constant. But now I'm going to get, this is the gradient of phi of f squared. Notice this is like q plus 1 over q plus 2. I can put it on the other side and I get a q plus 2. So I get a q plus 2 and then integral. And here I get phi to the q plus 1. And then I, s I get the integral of f squared. But the integral of f squared is the integral of q plus 2. And I didn't need to multiply that by q plus 2, but it doesn't do any harm if I do it. OK, so I get this inequality. Well, that's very good, because it's telling you that phi to a very high power, 2 q plus 2, imagine q is large, phi to a very high power, the integral of that is bounded by phi to this, this power q plus 1. The only thing we worry about is that I'm, I'm multiplying by this q plus 2, so we worry maybe that causes some trouble. In fact, it doesn't. So, so, let's, so, so what do we do? So, so what I want to do is replace uh, p for q plus 2. And uh, oh, sorry, I missed the power 1 half. And then I want to raise to the power 1 over p. And then this will give me that phi to the power l to the 2p is bounded by constant to the 1 over p, p to the 1 over p. This guy is essentially bigger than this, unless it's less than 1. So I, I can take the maximum of th this guy, which is just phi to the p, but I'm raising to the power 1 over p. So I get phi to the lp, and then 1. So I'm, I'm just sort of ignoring this guy and putting the maximum of this in one. So I get so I get this, and so you see that I get a bound for this high LP norm in terms of, a, of, of, of half of that, and and I iterate, and uh, when I iterate, it'll give me an L infinity bound. So the idea is, of course, that the as you take if you get a Take the limit as p goes to infinity, this will converge to the L infinity norm of p. So let me just do that briefly. So, so if I replace p, p by 2p, you get that phi to the L4p is bounded by constant to the 1 over 2p, 2p to the 1 over 2p, and then the maximum. Well, but then I would get the maximum of phi to the 2p. But then I apply the bound that I already have, and I get constant to the 1 over p, p to the 1 over p, and then the maximum of phi and lp and 1. And then I keep going. I keep replacing p by, by 2p, and I get that phi to the l 2kp is bounded by constant to the 1 over well, let's start here. Constant to the, I get constant to the 1 over p, constant to the 1 over 2p, all the way up to constant to the 1 over 2, I guess it would be k minus 1p. And then I would get p to the 1 over p, 2p to the 1 over p, all the way up to 2 to the k minus 1p to the power oh, over 2p, sorry. Uh, 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 over 1 over 2 to the k minus 1p times the maximum of phi lp and 1. And now I put p equals 2, and I let k go to infinity. And when you let k go to infinity, as I said, the limit of the lp norms gives you the l infinity norm, the soup norm. So phi and l infinity. It's just going to be bounded by a constant. And that's true as long as all of this mess here is bounded as k goes to infinity. 
Well, that doesn't look terribly obvious, but in, unless you, until you think about it a bit. Because what's happening here, p is 2, so this is just 1 half plus 1 quarter plus 1 eighth and so on. We know that converges. That's bounded. Here you have um, p is 2, so it's just 2 to the 1 over p times 2. Oh, there's an easier way of thinking about it. This is, this is just 2 to the k. You get 2 to the k to the power 1 over 2 to the k, p uh, over 2 to the k. So what you get here is you get a sum of, 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 of uh, you get the sum in the exponent of k over 2 to the k, but this, this converges. So, 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 so because here you get uh, k over something to 2 to the power of k over 2 to the k, and that converges. So we, so we, we make use of that. OK, so this gives you the, the, the L infinity, L infinity norm. Well, of course, one has to prove all the high. Or, or, you have to prove uh, that all the derivatives of phi are also bounded, and that takes uh, a lot more work too. But I'm going to skip over that and and move on to to, to the last two things I want to talk about. Okay, so obviously the, this is just the first step in the proof, but it's a key a key step. And you also see in this um, how much you you do use the Kähler condition. You see that you're integrating by parts all the time. Integrating by parts. You're using the fact that omega is closed. So now the question is, does this make sense if, if omega is not Kähler? So what, what if, suppose omega is not Kähler? What can we say? Does, does Yau's theorem still hold? And the, and the answer is yes, it does. So let, let me explain that. So, so let uh, gij bar now be a Hermitian metric. So still, it still defines a real 1-1 one, one form, omega. But in general, it's, it's, it's not closed. So it's not, it's not 0 in general. But this still makes sense as a real 1 1 form. Um, and we can ask the question uh, uh, wh whether, whether there's still a version of Yau's theorem. So this is a result of, in the case n equals 2, it's Hugh de Chaurier, who proved this in the 80s. And he proved it in some cases in higher dimensions. And then with Valentino Tosati, we, uh, we proved it in general. And what it says is that so you're given M G a compact Hermitian. A compact Hermitian manifold. And uh, if you if you let F be any given smooth function on M, then there exists, and it's unique. Now, it's going, to be, it's going to be slightly different from the statement of Yau's theorem for a reason. Not just a function phi, but also a constant b. So there exists a pair where phi is a smooth function, smooth real-valued function, and b is just some real number. And it satisfies that omega plus d d bar to the phi to the power n, the complex dimension, is equal to e to the f, but then I have to add a constant b times omega to the n with omega plus d d bar phi positive and the super phi. I need, of course, a normalization of the super phi, say, is equal to 0. So wh why, why we have this constant b? So the reason we have the constant b is that uh, unlike the, so we don't have any normalization condition for f. So in the Kähler case, when you integrate the right-hand side, you would get the integral of just omega to the n by Stokes' theorem. But here, we cannot use Stokes' theorem to conclude the integral of this is equal to the integral of omega to the n. So we just know that there exists some constant that makes this work. But we, we don't know what that constant is. We do know it's unique. 
Uh, and, and there's also, associated to this, there's a corresponding sort of, um, analog of the Calabi conjecture, too. So um, on, a, on, a complex, on a Hermitian manifold, any complex manifold with a Hermitian metric, you can define the so-called Bott-Chern class of M. And you define it to be the class of the Ricci of omega, where here this is, this is defined to be in the same, same formula as before. It's just minus dd bar log of determinant of g. This is called the churn ricci form, or the first Chern form. Oh, it had, maybe have other names. Chern, I'm going to call it the churn ricci form. And uh, it, uh, it doesn't equal the Ricci curvature. So it's not equal to the Riemannian Ricci curvature. It's not the same. But I'm still going to denote it by Ricci of omega. And this gives you an element of H11BC, which means that you simply take the, the D bar closed, which is the same as D closed, real 1, 1 forms. And you quotient out by the image of dd bar. Now, in the Kähler case, by the dd bar lemma, this is the same as the usual cohomology without this BC. The same as quotienting out by the image of d bar, but in general, it's different. And then a, a corollary is that uh, if you're, the corollary of this result is that if you're given capital omega in the first churn, Bot churn class of M, and fixing it, you're fixing a compact emission manifold. Then, then there exists, and it's unique, an omega prime of the form omega plus dd bar phi. It no longer makes sense to say it's in the same cohomology class. These are not closed. But you, there exists a unique emission metric omega prime of the form omega plus dd bar phi, such that um, the churn ricci form of omega prime is equal to that capital omega. And the proof is exactly the same word for word the same as the proof I just gave for the Calabi conjecture assuming Yau's theorem, because of the definition of this bot churn class. OK. Well, in the last few minutes, uh, 10 minutes or so, let me say something about the case of, of, of balanced and Godeschon metrics. Well, so you might think, uh, well, that's the end of the story, but it's not. Um, so, so, so first of all, what, what are these notions of metrics? So let me explain. Well, balance we saw in, in the last lecture is different from the. Sorry. How do you pronounce Gaussian? If the proof is exactly the same, why did Cherea just do it? My name is two. Uh, no, I said the proof of the corollary is the oh, same. No, not the proof of the theorem. <laughs> no, no, the theorem you you saw from the L infinity estimate. You really do use the Kähler conditions. And, yeah. So. Uh, OK, so, 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 so going back here, so the balance metric is, uh, is different from this balance metric that was talked about in, in Professor Godoshan's uh, lecture. It's, uh, it, we say that omega is, is, is balanced if, if, uh, when you take omega to the n minus 1 and you take d of it at 0. And we say omega is, is Godoshan. If, uh, if dd bar of omega to the n minus 1 is 0. So let me make a few remarks about this. Number one, uh, so of course, balanced implies go to Sean. Because uh, once this is, for the reason that you you can always replace this by d, if you like, because the, the, the d part will, will just vanish. Um, so, uh, uh, but, but the other way around is not true. Second, uh, there, there always exist Godeschon metrics. So given n, so this is a theorem of, uh, of Professor Godeschon. And that is that it, given, given, given uh, any Hermitian metric m omega, Hermitian, there exists a smooth function sigma such that e to the sigma omega is, is Godeschon. 
So, there is, so every omega is, is conformal to a Godeschamp metric, every Hermitian. And that sigma is unique up to the addition of a constant as well. So there exists lots of, uh, of Godeschamp metrics, balance metrics are a little bit rarer. The other note is that, in general, uh, omega, so this is the key point I want to make, is that go omega being balanced or being Godeschamp It does not imply, in general, that omega plus dd bar phi has that property. It's balanced or, 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 or good or shown. Um, unless, of course, n equals 2, because if n equals 2, then it's a linear condition on omega. But in, in, in general, it's, it's not, not the case. So, so that means that you can't, by this, uh, by this prescription, you're not going to be able to, so given omega go to Sean, you're not going to be able to find another go to Sean metric by adding dd bar of a function. You're not going to expect that to be go to Sean, unless n equals 2. So then the question is, uh, d d is, there, is there a version of Yao's theorem For, for, for balanced or, or, or Godeschamp metrics. So I'll, I'll talk about both of them simultaneously. And, and many people have asked this, uh, this question, including uh, Godeschamp and also uh, Popovici and, 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 and Fu and, and, and Xiao and, and other people. OK, so, so the first thing to note, of course, is if n equals 2, then the answer is yes. So, rather, so of course, in n equals 2, balanced is the same as Kähler. So there's nothing new. If n equals 2, go to Shana, uh, well, if n equals 2, then you can just apply this theorem, so Chariot's theorem. Because uh, if omega, you just take omega to be go to Shana, and then you'll find uh, Omega plus dd bar phi, which will still be good to Sean, because it'll still be dd bar closed, so solving this equation. But in general, uh, uh, in, in general, it's still unknown. But uh, so this is a recent work with Valentin Hosati. So we said that we showed that the answer is yes if M admits a Kähler metric. So suppose that suppose that M omega is a compact Kähler manifold. And suppose that you have some other metric, omega naught, is either balanced, so it's different from omega. Or, or, or it's go to Sean, so one, one or the other. Then there exists omega prime, which is balanced, or, or go to Sean. Oh, I guess I need to say something. Yes, yes, I'm fixing the compact Kähler manifold. And I want to let f be a smooth function. Then there exists omega prime balanced and a constant, a real number b, such that omega prime to the n is equal to e to the f plus b omega to the n. So you can, you can find a balanced metric or Godeschamp metric with prescribed volume form up to this addition of a constant. It's the same issue as here. Um, and omega prime um, is the unique such metric um, with the following property, that it looks like that it has the following property, that if you take omega prime to the n minus 1, it looks like 
omega 0 to the n minus 1 plus dd bar of a function phi wedge omega to the n minus 2. Um, so, so it's the unique, unique such metric of that type. And the way we, the way we, uh, we prove this is by looking at the Marjan pair equation um, uh, g uh, associated to this guy here. So, so we look at, so this equation was, I think, first written down by Fu, 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 Wu and, Fu Wang and Wu. They introduced this equation, which they called form type uh, Calabi Yao equation. You look at this equation. That's an n minus 1, n minus 1 form. You can take the determinant of that, and that equals e to the some function f tilde, say, omega, omega 0 to, say, determinant of omega 0 to the n minus 1. And Fu, Wang, and Wu showed that you can solve this equation assuming that omega has non-negative orthogonal bisectional curvature. And with Valentina recently, we showed you can remove that condition. You can always solve this equation up to adding a constant to f. And then this gives you, gives you a solution to this guy. And, uh, and, and also, you have the same interpretation in terms of the first churn form. So you can, on such manifolds, you can, you can find a, a balanced um, metric with prescribed first churn form. And uh, some physicists are sort of interested in, in this. In the case of first churn class zero, they have these so-called balanced metrics with torsion. This gives you a way to construct these ba balanced metrics with torsion. OK, so maybe I'll, I'll stop there. Uh, well, so in, yeah, so they, they, they uh, in the second order estimate, if you assume positive bisectional curvature, then you can directly get the second order estimate. So similar to Yao's theorem, if you assume that, you don't need the L infinity bound. You can just directly get the okay. decimal of the metric. So we showed that uh, you can get, uh, we showed you just get the L infinity estimate immediately. Just, we give a direct argument for L infinity estimate. And then we get a second order estimate in terms of the gradient of phi. So here we, put, we applied some, we modified an argument of how Ma and Wu to get a second order estimate in terms of the first order estimate. And then we did a blow up argument and we modified an argument of Dinef and Kovolgej. We did a blow up argument for, for the complex Hessian equation. We do a similar thing here with, um, for this equation. I have a kind of stupid question. So, I mean, I've seen the Calabria many times, but I never thought about it. So actually what it says is that even any Kähler metric is actually Einstein. Right? Uh, you start with omega, and then you show that omega or even Einstein. We show? So you started with mg, yeah, or mg, yes, yes. yeah. And then you show that uh, there is a solution that makes it Einstein. Well, in the case C1m is 0, yes. Yeah. Yeah, if C1 over 0, then yes, you can find an Einstein metric. In general, no. In general... But, but not only you can find an Einstein metric, is that your omega scalar is automatically Einstein. Well, you can find... You start with omega, you can find one which is cohomologous, an omega prime cohomologous to the original omega. So start with omega. Okay, I see, I see. Then you get an omega prime with Ricci of this right, right, right. equals zero. So, so not the same. Not necessarily Einstein. No, no, no. It's just cohomologous to something which is Einstein, assuming C1M is zero. Yeah. Yes? Uh, in the case uh, so you said uh, for non kähler manifolds, uh, the Ricci in the sense of both term is different from the Riemannian Ricci curvature. Yes. Uh, can we say something about which metric can be obtained as a Ricci curvature, Riemannian Ricci curvature? The, well, the problem in general is that the Riemannian Ricci curvature will be a, a tensor Rij, but it will not be, it will not give you a 1, 1 form. It will have 2, 0, and 0, 2 parts to it. So it won't be of type 1, 1, 1. So it's 1, 1, so it doesn't really make sense to relate it to 1, 1 form. Okay, good. Thanks for that. Come again.